Welcome to a brand new edition of Problematic Women. I'm Virginia Allen, and hosting with me today is Rachel Del Judas. Welcome, Rachel. Thank you so much, Virginia. And Lauren Evans. Thanks so much, Virginia. Up on today's Problematic Women, Stanford students protest Ben Shapiro's visit to campus with a flyer that deduces Shapiro to a bug that needs to be exterminated. And a mom tells her four-year-old son that boys can have periods, too. We talk with Megan Dom about feminism, social media outrage, Me Too, and more. And as always, we'll be crowning our Problematic Women of the Week. Each week on Problematic Women, we sort through the news to find stories that are of particular interest to conservative-leaning or problematic women, those whose views and opinions are often excluded by those on the so-called feminist left. If you are a problematic woman or just someone who supports strong, independent women, please consider supporting us by leaving a review or rating on iTunes and encouraging others to subscribe. It really does make a difference. All right. Well, before we jump in, we have to give a little disclaimer this week. We have succumbed to that time of the year where we are all very sick with various head colds. So we were adamant that we need to get the show on. But if we're a little loopy or a little coffee or our voice seems a little off, we apologize. We apologize. <laughs> but we're trying. It's a little rough. The tea is flowing. Honey, <laughs> lemon, <laughs> all the vitamin all C. The... Make sure you take care of yourselves during flu season. <laughs> Take lots of vitamin C. Lauren has been chugging Gatorade and swearing that that is uh, the cure for the common cold. I'm not so sure. Yeah, that's just something always growing up. Liquids and Gatorade and electrolytes, you just chug the Gatorade and that that's how you get better. See, I've heard of that with like the stomach bug, but never for just oh. a cold. Like It's pretty much just sugar. Oh. No, that's why you drink Gatorade <laughs> Zero or Powerade Zero. Tweet at us, hashtag problematic women, if you drink Gatorade when you're sick, no matter what kind of sickness. And, and justify me because I, every time somebody's sick, I'm like, here, take a Gatorade. <laughs> or if you have figured out the cure for the common cold and want to share your insight and wisdom, <laughs> let us know because we could use some of that. Awesome. Well, Rachel, can you get us on track? Sure. So we're starting off with Stanford student-led group, the Coalition of concerned students held a protest against conservative political commentator Ben Shapiro. Why did they do this? Well, because Ben Shapiro dared to come speak on their campus. The group posted flyers saying, we are tired of Stanford administration's complicity in putting black, brown, trans, queer, and Muslim students at risk by allowing SCR to bring Ben Shapiro to campus. We do not protest because we are too sensitive to hear opinions we don't like. We protest because we are strong enough to defend ourselves. The flyer pictured a bottle of bug repellent with Shapiro's face saying, Ben, be gone. In a Stanford Daily op-ed, the group argued that the form of the lecture prevented mutual representation of ideas. The lecture consisted of Shapiro speaking and then answering questions from the audience. Since there was no moderator or someone to challenge his ideas, the group felt that this gave Shapiro the upper hand and a way for him to cut sound bites for his media outlet's YouTube channel of himself owning the libs on college campuses. Protesters interrupted the lecture by chanting, Hey, hey, ho, ho, Ben Shapiro's got to go. Attendees countered the protest by chanting, USA, USA. So Virginia and Lauren, I'm curious what you think. The protesters specifically mentioned that free speech was not the issue, but that one, the form of the lecture prevented a fair counter argument from being presented, and that two, Shapiro's rhetoric promotes violence to certain minority communities. What are your thoughts about this argument that they have? The lecture format was a pretty standard and average lecture format for a college that, you know, an individual comes in and, you know, speaks for 30 minutes to an hour, and then opens it up for Q&A. So it wasn't like he was, you know, just going to come in and talk at them and then leave. Students were going to have an opportunity and did have an opportunity to ask questions and to engage and to challenge him. So I think by saying, you know, it wasn't fair because it wasn't, you know, a panel or, or a debate is just a little bit nonsensical because the students were going to have and did have their opportunity to challenge the views uh, that he presented. So I feel like it was a very fair format. I don't know, Lauren, what do you think? Well, the First Amendment doesn't guarantee that you get a speaker at every event that you want a speaker at. What it guarantees is that if you want to host another event with a speaker that speaks, that has the equal opportunity to be successful, 
That's what the First Amendment gives you. And so this argument that it's not fair because we didn't get a speaker on this panel, like that isn't what the First Amendment gives you. And also this argument that, oh, people are unsafe because Ben Shapiro is speaking on his campus. I think Ben Shapiro would be the first person to admit he is not a very uh, physically intimidating guy. He comes and he speaks on campus and he speaks fairly mainstream conservative views. And this idea that he's hateful just for what he says and for showing a different viewpoint, that's not true. And I'm sorry if someone gets hurt feelings because it's not what you've been hearing on this college echo chamber, but he's showing kind of what 40 percent of America believes. And these students just need to understand that these ideas aren't going away and, and we need to actually have a discussion. So I'm glad that finally they are acknowledging that there is a First Amendment thing at play. And I, I think they're kind of acknowledging Ben Shapiro's tactics of let me come to college campuses and kind of get everybody to argue. But what they're not acknowledging is that, yeah, there's there's actually good that comes with this. And, and what Ben Shapiro was trying to do is kind of force these people into having a conversation. And I think they're almost getting there where, OK, they're acknowledging that he's speaking. They're acknowledging that he has a First Amendment right. So as as frustrating as this is, and, and I think we, we see a news story like this, if it's not Ben Shapiro, it's Ali Stuckey, it's Alicia Krauss. It's all these big mainstream conservative speakers. But I, I think this is in a weird way, a step in the right direction. I think it's really interesting, too, what you mentioned, Virginia, that the fact that this was such a mainstream event set up. I mean, I think back to not that long ago, I mean, just a few years ago, when we would have speakers at my school, occasionally there'd be a moderator, but most of the time it was just the speaker getting up and speaking and then taking questions from the audience. And this is exactly the format that they were following here at Stanford. So I just think it's interesting that and to a degree, we've come so sensitive that we just can't even have like a normal lecture set up. I think that's – it's a, a commentary on our time. But I think it's also good that we're having these discussions um, to really recognize, you know, what our First Amendment rights are and why this is important to be talking about in the first place. So the protesters used the line, we do not protest because we are too sensitive to hear opinions we don't like. We protest because we are strong enough to defend ourselves. Lauren in Virginia, is this a good argument? No, because if they were strong enough to defend themselves, they would just get an, another speaker and have another event. They're too sensitive to hear this. They don't want anybody else to hear what Ben Shapiro has to say, because if not, they would just ignore him and then have their own event. And it would be the end of the day. We wouldn't be talking about this. And I think, you know, it's fine for them to to protest Ben Shapiro coming to campus to say, you know, we don't agree with his views, to be vocal about that. I really take issue, though, with the way that they did it, that they equated him to a bug that needed to be exterminated. And, I mean, you just don't do that with anybody. That's not OK. You're you're essentially saying that a human being with you know intrinsic value is just like a bug that needs to be killed or squashed. So really, really inappropriate way to protest someone. And I think they could have expressed their views in a much more articulate way and in a way that that made them as students look better. And can you imagine if it was the other way around, if the conservative group came up with a oh, flyer I like this? Imagine. Yeah, it, it would be on national news. They'd be talking about it every day about how hateful conservatives are. They'd be holding are. congressional hearings probably, <laughs> you know, in, no, in a matter of no time. So, All right. Well, we're going to switch gears and talk for a moment about. Parents Magazine, which highlighted a four-year-old boy holding a sign that said, Some men have periods too. If I can get it, so can you. This post comes in response to the brand Always, removing the female symbol from their products, a subject that we talked a little bit about on this podcast a couple weeks ago. The mom of the boy explained the photo by saying, I told him that some women, some non-binary people, and some men have periods. It was easy for him to accept, as he hadn't had to unlearn the ingrained societal norms. But if a four-year-old can grasp it, I'm sure most of us can have a crack at unlearning transphobic slash misinformed norms and opening our minds, you think? The Instagram photo had gained over 7,000 comments and counting, most of which were against the mom and the magazine. Some of the comments even accuse the mom of child abuse for telling her son that men can have periods. So Lauren and Rachel, do you all think that this actually equates to child abuse in any way? 
Or, I mean, is this mom really just entitled to tell her child what she believes about gender and about sex? Well, looking at the facts here, I just would like to remind people, this boy is four years old. Full stop, we shouldn't be talking to four-year-olds about sex and periods and even gender at four. I mean, I don't even think he can – he can't completely comprehend this right now. I mean, he's four years old. He's pretty much a toddler still. So the fact that he's four – And his mom is telling him these very, like, almost intimate, more mature details about biology. That's inappropriate. And the fact that she's lying to him by telling him men can have periods, too. I mean, this is – it's just wrong. And I think it does – I mean, personally, looking at this, I think it does border a little bit on child abuse or even maybe a degree of emotional abuse when you're telling your kid – a false reality, so to speak, about biology when it's just untrue. So, I mean, I think I think it definitely borders on child abuse, if not, you know, child abuse for sure. Well, because we don't know what that child is going to grow up to think. And now forever his photo is going to be on the Internet with this sign. And I think Rachel made so many great points about how, you know, a period kind of relates to sex in a way that it shows that a woman is is – reaching sexual maturity and that child has should not know what sex is and understand kind of what goes along with that and what goes along with gender because they're four he should be playing with toys and trucks and outside and yeah so uh, it's hard to to put the child abuse label on it because in some way it is a weird kind of mental abuse where she's forcing this viewpoint on this child when he's not old enough to understand it. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, in in the privacy of your home as a parent, obviously you have a right to talk to your child about what you see is fit and when, but to then at that young of an age take that conversation public and have their face plastered all over social media all over the news, you know, holding this sign uh, that is a view that, you know, they might not hold, you know, 10, 15 years uh, is is really damaging potentially to that child and, you know, to that individual's reputation in, in the coming years. So I think just not not wisdom on the part of the mom. But, you know, so many people did react very, very strongly to this, do you think that that response was warranted? I mean, how how should we go about talking about subjects like this with kids because it is coming up at an earlier and earlier age? I didn't get a chance to look at the comments. It looks like the Huffington Post had an article about this, and it looks like the Instagram post has since been taken down. But I do have to say, I'm glad that moms and people are reacting strongly because this is concerning that we have parents and moms today that are telling their little toddlers these things about sex and gender that aren't even biology that aren't even biologically accurate. So I'm glad that there was a strong response and I think that if it would have been a situation where this mom said this thing, posted it on Instagram and then people didn't comment and weren't concerned, I would almost see that as a little bit like alarming how far have we gone in society where a mom can tell such a blatant untruth to her four-year-old and just act like this is normal. Yeah, I agree. People should react strongly. That's kind of our only defense right now because it is happening and it is being normalized. So we have to stand up and say, no, this isn't right. They're children. Let's let them be children. And even when they get older, like we still don't agree with what they're saying. So yeah, I think it's definitely warranted. I think in order to combat this, we need to explain to our children and to our friends that we establish dignity for every human life from the time that they're conceived to the time that they die. And we have to love everyone, even if they do believe that men get periods or they believe that they're not the gender that they're born or no matter who they love. But at the end of the day, we need to remember that you're born who you're born. And we can't be in this world where you get to decide which gender you are. And yeah, a man is a man and a woman is a woman. And it's a hard concept to teach to children, especially in today's world, because I can't imagine if one of my children had a classmate who was transgender and you have to tell them like, no, you have to love that person and you have to accept that person. But we're never going to accept what that person is doing is right. And that's just really hard for us as adults to grasp. And then one of my colleagues was telling me too, another layer that I didn't even think about this is that you have to tell your child that they can never date that person. 
no matter what gender they are because you don't believe that their gender matches up. So it does just kind of opens this Pandora's box. So I'm glad that it's a conversation piece. I'm, I'm glad that the comments were mainly negative. I'm glad that they took it down because, yeah, we have to use our voice. We have to speak out against this because if not, it's just going to continue to happen and continue to get worse. All right. I want to take a second to tell you all about one of the other awesome podcasts here at the Heritage Foundation. You know, it's so easy to get overwhelmed by the 24-7 news cycle. And I know that you also might be overwhelmed just like sometimes I am. So if you're looking for a great way to keep up with all the news that matters, the Daily Signal podcast brings you the news of the day every day. I co-host the Monday edition with my colleague Rob Bluey to bring you interviews with lawmakers, authors, and conservative activists. And of course, we always start your week off right with a good news story. If you're a conservative who wants to be on top of the news, check out the Daily Signal podcast available every weekday morning. Our colleague and the editor-in-chief of The Daily Signal recently had a great conversation with Megan Dom, author and journalist, and they discussed social media, feminism, the social media culture, hashtag Me Too, and more. The interview was just too good that we had to share it with you all. So we hope you enjoy. Tired of high taxes, fewer health care choices, and bigger government? Become a part of the Heritage Foundation. We're fighting the rising tide of homegrown socialism while developing conservative solutions that make families more free and more prosperous. Find out more at heritage.org. Joining me today is Megan Dom, the author of The Problem with Everything, My Journey Through the New Culture Wars. Megan, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. Okay, so I actually started reading your columns when you were at the LA Times. I was in college at the time, and I know you always had an interesting perspective. You seem to not be quite right, not quite left. But I recently rediscovered you when you were writing about the intellectual dark web and your flirtation with it. So that really interested me because, of course, you're on the liberal side. And I was surprised to see some of the ideas and people you were listening to. And you also chronicled this in your book. So what, (laughs) this is such a weird way of putting it, what attracted you, I guess, to the intellectual dark web? How did this all come to be? Yeah, I I can best answer that with a, a personal story. So I got divorced about four years ago, and my husband, for all of our problems, ha- had really been my intellectual ally. We talked about things all the time. We just always were on the same page. We saw the same world. Even if our friends seemed to be having a different set of ideas, we we always felt sort of aligned. And, you know, we were both considered ourselves liberals, but we were very skeptical. We were both journalists. So we took, you know, took the issues on a case by case basis and were able to just constantly be talking about stuff. And the book is called The Problem with Everything, because like I say, you know, we were always sort of talking about the problem with everything. Like, you know, when you have a a great, you know, a sort of intimate conversational rapport with somebody, you're always sort of chewing on this, like, what is the problem with the world? What's the problem with everything? So when when we split up and I lost that, uh, it happened to coincide with the time around 2015 when a lot of people on the left started to just uh, engage in a rhetoric that was really extreme and very outrage based and people who had once seemed you know very reasonable and questioning and and like critical thinkers didn't seem to be thinking as critically anymore they were being enabled by social media and this was well before trump mind you this was not a trump effect yet so i had lost my intellectual ally and my husband and a lot of my friends seemed to be not occupying the same universe anymore and i found myself watching people on youtube talking to each other scholars and scientists and academics and politicians and all this sort of thing. So uh, I, that's I sort of drifted into this world that would later become known as the intellectual dark web. So among those figures and some of the ones associated with the movement are Joe Rogan, uh, Sam Harris, you mentioned Christina Hoff Summers, Ben Shapiro to a certain extent. Are there particular voices you listen to especially or and why do you think you were open to that? Well, what got me started, it was Glenn Lowry and John McWhorter on bloggingheads.tv. Oh, wow. I forgot about that. Oh, they are. (laughs) This is the best show in town, I'm telling you. So Glenn Lowry uh, is an economist at Brown University. John McWhorter is a a linguist and a cultural critic. They're both African-American. Their show is called The Black Guys on bloggingheads.tv. And they would talk about all kinds of things, but especially issues of race in this incredibly nuanced, 
just really intellectually honest, thorough, thoughtful way that I had never heard anybody talk about race like that before. Um, and I was totally mesmerized. And I think Glenn is a little bit on the right, at least very centrist. John is a liberal, although I think he was affiliated with the Manhattan Institute at one point. Anyway, they're they're not like hardcore left or right. I would say they certainly they're they're certainly not Trump supporters. I doubt they vote Republican. I know I'm sure Glenn did at one point. Anyway, all this is to say it was not a partisan show that was not the tenor of the conversation. So I started watching them and they would have these about hour long conversations every couple weeks, maybe every month. So I started watching them on YouTube and then the YouTube algorithm started taking me down the rabbit hole of all sorts of other people. And I would watch like Camille Paglia uh, talking to Christina Hoff Summers. I, I guess I saw a little bit of Joe Rogan at that time. And, you know, some of these figures I liked more than others. But this world of people talking to each other for long periods of time became a sort of sustenance for me. And it, and it just became a huge part of my life and my, and my sort of brain life. So I think you used the phrase echo chamber and how this moved away from it. And why do you think that liberalism is moving in this direction where there isn't as much room for disagreement right now? What's going on there? Well, I would say it started I, – I think it started on the right. I mean – Rush Limbaugh was the original outrage machine, and now the left has just sort of co-opted it. I mean, the left has become, in some corners, not all, but in many, like a bunch of little teeny tiny Rush Limbaugh's, right? So that's what we're that's what we see on Twitter. I think that social media has just flattened discourse in such a way that it's much, much easier to just say something very simple, very reductive, something that you know the people who follow you are going to approve of and therefore give you likes. And it's like a dopamine hit. It's it's not we're not really participating in conversation as much as saying things in order to have other things echoed back to us. So it all feels good. I, to me, it really comes from a place of loneliness. And I, I think that's true for, for everybody, not just, you know, this is like a universal human problem right now is we're all so much on our screens and so much of our social interactions are happening in this mediated way that. We, we all, we're sort of desperate for any kind of connection. And connection online can only be found if you say something immediately translatable and, and very easily hashtagable or memeable or whatever it is. Yeah. And I, I would agree that that's a problem on the right, too. Like, I've noticed – and it didn't seem to me – I've been on Twitter since 2009. And it seemed to me that in the early years it wasn't as much like this. Yeah, that's about when I joined, too. I think oh, yeah. eight. Yeah. Did it yeah. seem to you that around – maybe around 13 or 14, I felt like there began to be a shift. And it was like – unless – yeah, you would have to say, like, what is the most partisan thing you can throw out there? And then that would get all the retweets. And it right. it just – it changed it completely. I honestly – I stopped tweeting a lot. It was – because it, it felt like, you know, what's the point of preaching to the choir? <laughs> well, exactly. To me, especially if you're a journalist, if you're a writer or somebody whose job it is to think in the world, preaching to the choir is a dereliction of duty, in my opinion. I mean, it is our job to look at the world and see where the hypocrisies are and see where the cognitive dissonance is and think about like, OK, well, this is what's going on in the world. And these are the assumptions and the, the approved messages and do I think those are true? What do I think people are getting wrong about that? And it's our job to take all of that and metabolize it into something that's interesting and provocative and it's going to make people think. And that very process is disincentivized now because of the value system of social media discourse. Yeah. And I think – I was thinking about your Rush Limbaugh example and I was like, I don't think that's true. And the reason – I would push back a little on that one, and this might be my own bias showing through, is I think that, you know, conservatives, and I I, <laughs> I was homeschooled, like, I know the conservative bubble, but you can't open, it's like, there's no media that reflect, like, you get the opposing view in your face all the time. Oh, where, the mainstream media yeah, is left. Yeah, I, I think, in, just in terms of story selection, and I mean... Daily Signal is a conservative outlet. That affects what we choose to cover. So I don't know. I guess in some ways I would say that Rush was kind of like an alternative, but it was never really – the ability to stay in that bubble was pretty hard. Well, I think in terms of tone, that was – you know what actually really interests me about – conservative talk radio is that it it coincided with people moving to the exurbs. And so the longer people had commutes in their cars, the longer distances they were driving, the more they were listening to Rush Limbaugh and like the AM radio guys. I find this fascinating because I'm a huge radio fan. I always have been. 
And so that kind of dynamic is, I think, compelling and, and worth thinking about. And so, and now, but now yeah. people are listening to podcasts while they're driving. No, and no commercials, which right. is nice. No, right. but I remember uh, growing up, my mom would <laughs> switch the dial between Rush Limbaugh and then in commercials, we would go to the liberal station. And it was great. We would get both perspectives. That's, that's good parenting. So on the social media, you also get into one chapter, the infamous United Airlines leggings incident. And this, that... is, this is the controversy of our time. Right. For readers who aren't familiar, a girl was told she couldn't go on a United Airlines flight because she was wearing leggings. It turned out she was on a discounted ticket because she was with a United Airlines employee. They all have a dress code. That all got lost, and it became a huge thing about why is United policing what girls wear. And you said this particularly rankled you. Why? Well, it particularly rankled me because I am a fuddy-duddy when it comes to how people should dress on planes. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I always I lived in Los Angeles for a long time, and I always said I think it is actually against the law to fly in or out of LAX without wearing sweatpants with juicy written across <laughs> the butt. I think that is required. I think it is like an FAA regulation <laughs> that you cannot land or take off from LAX unless you are wearing this. It, you know, it rankled me because it was just such an example of, first of all, somebody butting their nose into a situation that they really did not know was going on. So specifically, yeah, it was a family traveling on an employee buddy pass, and there were maybe three kids or, you know, there were some girls. And so the, the there were little girls, and they were wearing leggings, and they were allowed to keep the leggings on, but because there was a girl over 12 or something like that, according to the regulations— she had to just put on, like, a skirt over the leggings. And the family, by the way, was completely fine with this. It was not an issue. They were not politicizing this moment. They were just trying to get on the plane. They were like, okay, okay, you know. And what was happening was there was a woman in, in another line, like, not even for the same flight, kind of a few gates away. Oh, I don't think I knew this. Okay, oh, yes, this is perfect. Yes, yes. Okay, so, so someone, oh, no, there's a some deep, busy body deep who's story. just watching. Yeah, so the, the, and the woman who was watching, she was observing this from afar and seeing this going on, and she starts tweeting, oh, you you know, there's a, a little girl is being forced to she's being body shamed be, and not allowed to get on this flight because of sexist gate agents at United or something like that. This woman happened to have a lot of followers. She was herself um, a very well-known activist and gun control activist. So she had a lot of followers. She starts tweeting this and then a bunch of celebrities picked it up. So, it, you know, it was I don't know if the usual suspects, Alyssa Milano. I, I know William Shatner tweeted photos of everyone started tweeting photos of themselves in leggings, including w <laughs> William Shatner, who had like a very hilarious shirtless photo of himself in oh, leggings. Gosh. And, and you know, everyone was jumping in on this and. You know, male celebrities, female celebrities, uh, you know, trying to show solidarity with this girl that she was being body shamed. And the whole thing was absurd. And nobody connected that this was just a normal dress code because they were traveling on an employee buddy pass, which is actually a pretty serious perk. And until recently, men flying on this pass had to wear suits, coats and ties. This Whoa. is a serious thing. Yes. That's insane. In my view. It's not insane. I think everybody should wear coats and ties to fly for, personally. I, I I'm hope very, you never run an airline. I'm, I would uh, not. I, really? I think many people would fly my, my airline. <laughs> it's called, it's called Fuddy Duddy Air. <laughs> but uh, no, so that was an example. And it just exploded and every celebrity was using it as a, you know, a vehicle for their own self-promotion and to virtue signal and to really gain social capital off of this situation that was effectively a fictional one, because this is not what had happened. So I, I use that as an example of something that can just catch fire and, and has no meaning whatsoever. And in fact, what happened with the Covington High School kids a year or so later is an exa exactly the same dynamic, and it caught fire in a much bigger way and with much greater repercussions for people and, and in a really appalling, just the, the absolute lack of will to understand that situation. I don't know if we need to Tell, remind our listeners what that was. I think but... they're familiar okay. with the, yes. yeah, the yes. boy who was at the March for Life yes. and smirked in front of a Native American activist. And, and when, in fact, what he was doing was holding his ground because the, uh, what was the group? There was another oh. group, the, the Black Israelites or the whatever. Yeah, the, the ones, the... They, they shot really crazy things. I yeah. can't remember that. And at, yeah. so, so this kid was shamed for supposedly smirking at a Native American activist when, in fact, he was trying to keep calm because there was another group yelling absolutely appalling and, I'm sure, to a high school kid from Kentucky, totally baffling and shocking yeah. things. 
and so actually the kid should have been commended for his composure and it totally went the other way and it's just and it and it became a calling card for a lot of people on the left just once again reaffirm where they stand and and signal to their tribe that they're on the right side and that to me is just the height it's the height of of not only dishonesty but laziness and i see that more and more with the way the media handles any number of stories. There's no will to actually scratch beneath the surface and see what's going on because complexity is, it's it's not only not rewarded, it's penalized in the current landscape. Well, it's also interesting because sometimes you wonder, and this is going to sound very old fashioned to me, but like we, we seem to ignore that there are vices of, um, I think you use the word schadenfreude in your book. Schadenfreude. Schadenfreude. Yes, schadenfreude. Yes. Okay. That's how you say it. Sometimes it just seems that so much on the internet is making fun of other people. And sometimes it's people who deserve to be made fun of. But I sometimes wonder when I catch myself spending time doing this, I'm like, is this really the best use of my life? <laughs> And is this really make like uh, it's it's a little uncomfortable and it strikes me as interesting that there's not more tension in our culture where we wonder ought we to do this. But anyway. Yeah, I was think, you know, people we should ask ourselves if we're about to tweet something or you know, put something up, you know, say am I doing this do I feel a moral obligation to say this or am I actually just self-soothing? Cuz I think that's a lot of what's going on. You say it because you have a moment of insecurity or you know, loneliness or anxiety or whatever, and I'm going to say this thing, and I know it's going to get a response, and it's going to give me a little jolt and make me feel better. Yeah. For one and those, second. Those... For, and then you'll have to do it again <laughs> 10 seconds later. Yeah, those jolts are real. I, I realized how bad my own addiction was when um, a few months ago my sister was like, okay, I'm not going to check my Instagram likes after I post this picture for three hours. And I was like, whoa, what self-control? And then I was like, what is wrong right. with me? I got to go to a meeting. I'm going to go to a meeting uh, you know, during these three hours to my 12-step so I can not look at Instagram. That, I yes. should probably go to that Instagram meeting. Instagram anonymous. <laughs> Do you think there's any hope for social media? Is there anything that could make it better? I think we're already starting to see the tipping point. People are really, really sick of this. And I can tell you a few things about this book. A lot of people told me not to write it. So I consider myself a liberal. I still consider myself a feminist. I always have. Um, But it really came out of a certain increasing disconnect with the the modern, the contemporary iteration of of both of those things. I, I did not feel that um the 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 new left was necessarily representing my values all the time there was a sort of purity policing that interestingly we used to associate with the right right we would associate it with Jesse Helms and Tipper Gore even though she was a democrat but you know remember when she was putting labels on on records mm-hmm. and and so there was this there was this sort of um moral authoritarianism that the left really never had anything to do with. And suddenly it was coming from there. And I thought, my gosh, everything that I stood for, just sort of, you know, the rights of the individual and just letting people do what they want and not being so such a prude, other than in flying, of course, I remain my, <laughs> my prudish self. Uh, suddenly the, the left is espousing all of these things. So I, I was felt very alienated from it. And I wanted to write a book that really captured th- that very confusion. And it wasn't just that I wanted to hammer away at things like trigger warnings and you know, radical campus activists, because a lot of people have done that. And, you know, I think there are very obvious things to say about that. I wanted to really examine my own confusion. And I wanted to do a self-interrogation. Like, what is it about growing up when I did in the 70s and the 80s that made me um, identify as a feminist in certain ways? And why is the contemporary version of feminism so alienating to me? Um, And so, I wanted to do that kind of book. And this is to your question. People were saying, don't do it. Don't do it. You know, we can't. We have, There's, you know, for so many reasons. First of all, everyone will annihilate you on Twitter and your career will be ruined. You're a person in the media. You need the, you know, you need your tribe. And another thing that the left continues to say, and I, I hear this, it's like, the Trump emergency is so dire that we need all hands on deck and we need to be totally on message and anything that might be the slightest bit complicated or any issue to, to tease out any issue in a way that requires talking about it for more than 30 seconds or thinking about it deeply and considering other points of view might give leverage to the other side. And it might be an opportunity for the other side to take your point and twist it up and use it for nefarious purposes. And you see it happen all the time. You try to have an intelligent conversation about something like the gender wage gap, for instance. Uh, And 
the other side will go and just say, oh, yes, you're right. See, the, you know, the, it, it's it's to- it is women's fault that there's a gender wage gap. And I'm actually saying, well, it's the result of a lot of things, including choices women make and on down the line. Mm-hmm. But the other side will take it and run with it. And then the left will say, see, you shouldn't have brought it up. You should not have brought it up because this is what happens. And that makes me so crazy. And really, the crux of the book is a call for nuance and a call for people to just calm down and have conversations and entertain complexity. And I think that social media makes that difficult. But I also am seeing more and more people listening to podcasts. They're listening Mm -hmm. to three hour long podcasts. They're (laughs) listening to people talk to each other for hours and hours. And I can tell you going around and talking about this book, doing events, there is such hunger to have more nuanced conversations. People come up to me and say, oh my God, just thank you for for saying all this. And so that really makes it worthwhile, even though a lot of my colleagues in the media still think I'm crazy. Yeah, I mean, it's awful. It's You get really scared to think out loud at all because it's like, oh, well, what if I misphrase something or it, I mean. But that's our job. You know, I, I always say like if the if the smart, thoughtful people don't step up and, and speak the truth and try to make complicated, honest points, the stupid, thoughtless people are happy to do the job for us. <laughs> so you mentioned feminism. Um, you talked about Me Too in the book and that you felt you were an older feminist when in that movement. How uh, – what did you think of Me Too? And what did you think of the feminist response to Me Too? It's such a hard question because it depends – Me Too is so big and it's so evolving all the time. And it, it's a spectrum. Obviously, cases like Harvey Weinstein, Bill Cosby, that's not negotiable. I don't think any – sentient person would argue that 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 was handled improperly. Uh, But then you have cases like Aziz Ansari, where something that, you know, to somebody my age, I'm 49, that's going to, I'm going to interpret that as like a bad date, a yucky experience. And women 20 years younger will say, "Uh uh-uh, no, like we, we, you know, we need to, to put this in the category of, of harm, of real harm done and, and some kind of violation that requires uh, adjudication or some sort of corrective. And that was the moment where I think the the generational divide became totally pronounced. Like we were sort of on board for a while and then that happened and then there was a real split. And so what I wanted to do to answer your question is to, you know, again, not just say, well, you guys are wrong and the older ones are right and you guys should just toughen up and all that. But I wanted to go back and think about what it is that made me that way. And I don't know how old you are. I think you're a lot younger than I am. But, okay. But I can tell you that growing up in the 70s as a kid, as a girl, it was a great gift because that was a time, and I don't know if you, you probably, this may be the first you're hearing about this. It was a time when, like, there weren't, like, super girly girls or, you know, super macho boys. Everyone was just sort of a kid. There was a sort of weirdly. That actually sounds great. (laughs) And it was. It was. And there was this sort of androgynous aesthetic, like, everybody watched the Bad News Bears. Uh, You know, there was this, there, there were not you know, pink toy aisles and blue toy aisles. They were not Disney princesses. It was cool for girls to be tomboy. And the girls were were doing better than the boys. I never had any sense of myself as anything but equal to, if not better than boys. And that continued as I grew up into the 80s when I went, by the time I got to college in the late 80s, early 90s, there were more women than men going to college. I got into my 20s and 30s and women were like buying their own real estate and having babies and adopting babies on their own. And the guys were just kind of like twiddling their thumbs, waiting for their lives to start. You know, in I'm talking in huge generalizations, but I, that was observable. So it was quite striking to me, fast forward a couple of decades, when maybe starting about five years ago, the, the default premise of the conversation around women was that we were this monolithic, oppressed class under the thumb of the patriarchy. And I it didn't resonate with me, but Frankly, it resonated with enough of my friends, even my same age friends, that I wanted to really investigate what, if anything, I was missing. Yeah, and I think Me Too, you know, it was complicated for us, too, at Daily Signal, because as you said, there were the very clear-cut cases, and then there were the ones that were just so much more complex, and it was like, where does due process fit in? But at the same time, you know, women obviously shouldn't be pressured. And I think one thing in the Aziz and Sari case was – uh, really drove this home for me. It was like, I thought the way he behaved was, you know, if accounted accurately, we've never really heard his side of the story, but it was reprehensible. And it was the sort of thing that struck me as he ought not to have done it. I don't think 
like publishing it and there's certainly no criminal offense. I, right. I guess what it sort of struck me was there is something deeply wrong in our culture that he thinks this is okay and that this resonates with so many women, which suggests a lot of men think this is okay. But I don't think Me Too is the way to fix it. Well, and it depends what we mean by Me Too fixing something. But this is well, yeah. really interesting, actually, because you're on the right and I still yeah. claim that I'm on the left. But I actually would push back at that a little bit because I, it's not clear to me. I wouldn't call what he was doing reprehensible. I would call it like pushy. And from what I remember of the case, weren't they both sort of like then sitting on the couch naked together and watching TV? Yeah, and I and mean, to be fair, like it's been like that. a year right, since I, I read but, the article. Let's, let's not, I don't want to, you know, don't, you know, fact check me on this. <laughs> this, I'm just like flashes of memory. But, you know, I, as a 49 year old, I'm going to look at that and say like, well, it, he, she wasn't being kept there against her yeah. will. She could have walked out at any time. She wasn't sure what she wanted. It seemed like she was sort of disappointed and his level of commitment potentially. I don't know, all of these things. And so for someone like me, my reaction is that kind of case diminishes the important parts of me too. When we have that sort of thing, it makes us less able to fight the the more clear cut cases. And I think if you care about me too, you care about due process mm -hmm. and taking a, a, a testimony like that and publishing it publishing it without mm -hmm. getting um, doing your due diligence and getting a comment from the person who's accused. That's just like a, a blatant violation of due process. So this is see, this is exactly <laughs> this is what's so interesting, because we're like ostensibly yeah. on opposite sides ideologically. But um, you're much more forgiving. I mean, you're, well, you're much, no, think, you're much more ha it's... harsher on Aziz Ansari. I, I guess I, I think my impression was he behaved very selfishly. And I think that, you know, ideally when dating and relationships, you should be thinking about the other person's good. And if you're just out to, you know, get some. You like, should be. That's... But this is not reality. But yes, right. You and be. to be fair, I do agree. Like, I do think one of the things about Me Too that was frustrating was the number of cases where it wasn't. And obviously, you know, there can be an act of rape without any violence or whatever. But at the same time, like women do have an amount of agency. And yeah, that sort of got lost. Yeah. And, you know, one of the interesting things about agency, if you notice, like around the, the conversations around race and gender, we're in this moment where when you when we're talking about racism or misogyny, for instance, those concepts are being applied onto systems and groups of people and not individuals. You don't think like this person is racist you think white people are white supremacist mm -hmm. or we live in a white supremacy and so we're taking these ideas and putting them on gigantic entities and it really robs individuals of their agency it's quite an interesting thing that's happened that way so speaking of that you have a subway incident you recount in the book that i think touches on some of these themes can you share that with our listeners yes and i'll try not to take forever to describe it so uh i was on the new york city subway maybe about a year or so ago and I was, it was probably 1130 at night or so. I, I live um, way uptown past Harlem. And uh, the subway was pretty full, which is always remarkable to me because I lived in New York City 20 years ago and the city was very different. There was a lot of crime. If you were on the subway that late at night, you were probably like by yourself or with one other person. So you would just be dying for a lot of people to be on the subway. So the car was like fairly full. I was sitting there reading my phone. There were two guys across from me, probably in their early 20s, white guys kind of hipster guys and there were these group there was this group of giggling girls a little bit further down in the car and they were like looked like they were from the suburbs they were they were white they were you know kind of had a lot of makeup on they seemed a little tipsy like maybe they had come into the city for a bridal shower or birthday party or something and so everyone's going along their way and the, a guy gets into the car at one point and he's pretty clearly homeless. He's panhandling. He's asking for money. He is black. And he comes up to me and he starts kind of trying to talk to me. And he says, oh, you have blonde hair. You're so pretty. Can you give me some money or something? And I did the thing I usually do, which was like, no, no, thanks. You know, just kind of friendly, wave him off. And then these girls across from me, he goes over to them and, and they find him this novelty. They, they think he's just like so, so exotic and exciting. And so they're flirting with him and, oh, what are you doing? And and they, he sits down with them and they're laughing and they're joking. And, and you just got the feeling that they were exoticizing him somehow or like so pleased with themselves that they were out on the town. And now they were having this experience with this guy who was clearly mentally ill or homeless or bo probably both. He was very wiry and sort of unsteady on his feet. He didn't pose 
pose a threat to anybody. And the other people on the subway car were kind of rolling their eyes or looking around. So finally, after this visit with them, he, he decides to get off of the subway. And I'm, I'm sitting there. And, you know, he's saying goodnight to them. They're saying goodbye, goodnight, have a great night. And he passes me and he gets right down in my face and he says, you, he says, you have a f up night. <laughs> and I just kind of laughed. I was like, OK, like I kind of put my hands up and it's like, OK, OK. And then he goes <laughs> and he gets off and I was kind of, you know, chuckling a little. And the two guys across from me, the white hipster guys said, Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry that happened to you. I'm so sorry. I'm just so sorry you had to go through that. And I was like, oh, you know, whatever. And, and they go, no, 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 really. That's just really wrong. It's really wrong that you had to go through that. And I realized at that moment that they weren't really concerned about me. They were apologizing on behalf of the patriarchy. They felt that what this guy with absolutely no agency, no power, nothing whatsoever, that he represented some patriarchal force that was threatening me and that they had to answer for it. And, you know, I don't know anything about them. They could have been anybody. But, like, I just imagined them as being, you know, recent liberal arts graduates and they received the full complement of intersectional doctrine. And they had assumed that this was the power hierarchy. And here's the irony about this. They were actually, in, in trying to protect me or apologize on behalf of the patriarchy, they were actually patronizing me. They, they were not seeing the big picture at all. This had nothing to do with the patriarchy. It had to do with, with the mental health system. It had to do with drugs. It had to do with homelessness, the whole wounded city and wounded world, you know? But they had reduced it to misogyny. And it just seemed to me the ultimate irony. Like, how how far are we getting in this conversation about sexism if we're going to reduce situations to the uh, the lowest common denominator that is actually incorrect. And that's also interesting because it harkens back to what you were saying earlier about the fake stories we tell on social media, where in some cases the facts are correct, but the context is so removed that the essence you know, of what happened really does make it fake news in a weird way. Yeah. And there's also just this currency in in being harmed. I don't want to throw around words like victim. I, you know, that's become ridiculous at this point. But it's, you know, being traumatized. It, there's like social capital in that I've noticed and, and sharing a story about how you were microaggressed or somebody did something to you. And, you know, you'll notice that this is coming from the most privileged people in the world. And because they're privileged and really not that much has happened to them, they have to seize onto the microaggression idea because otherwise they don't have anything. That That's the only hand they can play. That's something. So last question. <laughs> I'm very impressed by your open mindedness. Do you think there's any areas that, you know, where liberal and conservative women can work together right now? Is there ways that we can communicate better? I mean, obviously, there's some areas that we're just not going to agree on. But right. is there some hope? Well, the irony of all this polarization to me is that I would I think it's fair to say that the majority of people do not like our president. I think that's fair to say. I don't know. I'm not going to speak for you. We're I definitely going to get some reader institution. emails. Okay. But like, yes, he does have some supporters. But, you know, for the for the most part, we have a common enemy. We 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 can come together, no matter what our our small differences are, to fight this thing that I think at least you know certainly more than fifty percent of the population would rather not the situation in the White House be what it is. You know, there's this concept that came from Sigmund Freud, the narcissism of small differences, and what that refers to is the way that you know the the more and more people have in common. And the more that the society is actually glued together, the more people start fighting over the little things. And so it's it's kind of a paradox, right? Like we think we've never been more polarized, but in fact, we're all sort of enjoying the the benefits of of prosperity and relative safety. And in a lot of ways, the country's never been better. I mean, we've never been freer. We've never been safer. We're not yeah. we're not living in. I, I know that a lot of like you know, third and fourth wave feminists like to talk as if we're living in a third world country when it comes to women's issues. We're not. And so it's much easier to argue over these little these little differences. But, you know, it's interesting you hit on that because I think one of my most vivid 2016 memories 
is a friend of mine saying to me, if you voted for Trump, I don't want to ever know it. And I'm not actually going to say what I well, did. Well, that's how we got it. We didn't know we didn't know anything. That's how he got but it. That's I how he got voted in. Thinking and I, you know, I, the president has said many things I don't agree with and wish he had phrased differently. Um, you know, I appreciate his work on judges and the pro life issue, but I, I remember just that sort of stayed with me, and especially in a town like D.C. I don't know. It's just interesting. I do get like afraid. You feel like if you say I'm sure, but not like I mean not not in a, I don't want to over exaggerate it. It's just like in a social capital way. You're yeah. like how I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> I would say yes. Um, I I have to say I I am encouraged. People people are getting tired of the of the blunted discourse, and I really think are are hungry for real conversation. And yeah. and and you know the fact is, people. People are probably friends with all sorts of people who have views that they don't even know they have those views. And lo and behold, they're still friends. They're still like playing golf together and hanging out together. Maybe. I wonder if we should all have like political outing day where everyone tells their <laughs> friends and colleagues. Because I do think there's so much self Censoring. censoring. The go- and I actually remember I grew up uh, near San Francisco and I used to work at Borders Books. May it rest in peace. Wow. And I... This was back in the 2000s, and I had a colleague, and I mentioned that I like George W. Bush. And she, like, just stared at me. And she said, I thought you were a nice person. Wow. And I was like, well, you should call her up now and ask how she feels about that now. She would probably walk across glass for a mile to get George W. Bush back in office. No, but now I'm going to try to make political outing day a thing. I'm going to. All right. Hashtag. (laughs) Hashtag. Political outing. Day. I don't know. I got to come up with a better term. But everyone in business who's afraid to say their truth. Megan Dom, the author of The Problem with Everything My Journey Through the New Culture Wars. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you. It was really fun. Americans have almost entirely forgotten their history. That's right. And if we want to keep our republic, this needs to change. I'm Jarrett Stepman. And I'm Fred Lucas. We host The Right Side of History a podcast dedicated to restoring informed patriotism and busting the negative narratives about America's past. Hollywood, the media, and academia have failed a generation. We're here to set the record straight on the ideas and people who've made this country great. Subscribe to The Right Side of History on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, and Stitcher today. All right, welcome back for our final segment this week. We are going to crown our problematic woman of the week. Can I get a drum roll, please, ladies? I'm so bad at these drum rolls. <laughs> well, unlike our drum rolls, this problematic woman of the week is awesome, and it is Nikki Haley, the former governor of South Carolina and the previous United States ambassador to the UN. In 2018, during discussions of U.S. sanctions in Russia, Larry Kudlow told the press that Haley had, quote, spoken ahead of the curve, and their quote, might have been some momentary confusion. Haley famously responded, quote, with all due respect, I don't get confused. This was the inspiration for the title of her new book, With All Due Respect, Defending America with Grit and Grace. Haley's book just hit the shelves this week and is already a number one Amazon bestseller. While her 2012 memoir, Can't Is Not an Option, dealt with her journey to becoming the first female and Indian American governor of South Carolina, This book will chronicle her battles with America's critics at the U.N. and shares behind-the-scenes looks at her work in the Trump administration. Part of the title is Defending America with Grit and Grace, which, by the way, could be a subtitle of this podcast. How, Virginia and Rachel, have you seen Nikki Haley exemplify this? I think one example um, that I've seen her and her leadership exemplifying Grit and Grace is whenever she announced that the U.S. was leaving the U.N. Council on Human Rights And right when that happened, I think that was um, in the middle of June, I think around June 19th, she made that announcement. And right after that, she came to Heritage, the Heritage Foundation here in Washington, D.C., and spoke about uh, this decision and basically said the U.N. Council on Human Rights is basically doing the antithesis of what it claims to do. Like, they're basically saying that Israel um, is in the wrong all the time when they're not, um, when it's trying to defend itself. She essentially was saying it's wrong for uh, the United States to be involved in a council that's basically kind of like, you know, shooting itself in the foot by not actually advancing human rights and being more of a political tool to advance whatever the U.N. thinks is appropriate versus like the U.S.'s best interests. So that was one example where I saw her just kind of going out. It wasn't a popular decision. She did receive a lot of flack for it, but she stood by the administration's decision to do that and was very articulate and 
you know, taking that stand. So that's one example I've seen. Yeah, I think, you know, you just continually see Nikki Haley really act with so much grace. And, you know, she's been such a, a prominent and active voice in standing up uh, against uh, a- anti-Semitism and uh, standing up for Israel and, and the Jewish people. I also just so respect her for the priority that she places on family. And I think you continually see that in uh, in her life, that she really strives to to lead well, uh, but also lead well at, at home. Um, and, you know, she made that decision to, in part, to step down as uh, the ambassador to the UN in order to have more time with her family. Uh, and I think that's really, really awesome and really beautiful and just kind of a good reminder uh, for all of us that, you know, make sure... Uh, in every season of your life that your priorities are where they need to be. But she uh, she certainly is a fireball, and I, I don't think we have seen the last of Nikki Haley on the world stage. I think she's going to continue to make waves and continue to have huge impact. And I always love how she used her femininity, not as a crutch or anything that made her, made her a victim, but because she was a woman just made her stronger. And she's so kind of graceful. Like, I think Grit and Grace is just such a great subtitle for this book. So speaking of the book, what are you most excited uh, to read about? I'm really excited to just read some of her behind the scenes reflections of her work in the Trump administration, how she navigated just all the different situations that she found herself in as the uh, ambassador to the UN. Uh, There's a little sneak peek preview that Amazon had and it discusses, she's telling the story of when she was going to Austria uh, to visit the UN's agency in charge of nuclear weapons and how that trip almost didn't happen and what she learned from that. And I'm, I'm just curious to see how she tells these stories and how she brings in just the her own perspective and the values that she was faithful to and how she was able to, you know, serve every time I think in politics is challenging, but especially now when the left is you know, so strong. And basically, there's a crusade against the Trump administration and whether or not people agree or disagree with the president, that seems to be the paramount goal. And she was able, it it seems to navigate that really, really well. So I'm very curious to see how she tells these stories, because I think there's a lot we all can learn from them. Yeah, I think there's always so much that happens behind closed doors that we don't see. And you get those glimpses in in books like these, you know, to to what happened in that meeting uh, that either no one knew happened, maybe, or that, you know, you only get the get what the news reported and to actually hear it from someone that was in the room and a part of it and, you know, meeting with foreign leaders. Uh, that's it's such a neat part of history to be able to to take part in. So the book is, with all due respect, Defending America with Grit and Grace. You can buy it on Amazon, online, or if you're kind of old-fashioned, go to the bookstore. But whatever you do, go buy it. Support Nikki Haley. And with that, it's going to be it for today's episode. Join us next Thursday morning for a brand new edition of Problematic Women. And in the meantime, please take a moment to subscribe and share. Conservatives do need your support in the podcast world, and we would greatly appreciate a five-star review on Spotify, SoundCloud, iTunes, or wherever you get your podcasts. It really does make such a difference. Have a great week. Problematic Women is brought to you by more than half a million members of the Heritage Foundation. It is a product of The Daily Signal produced by Kelsey Bowler, Lauren Evans, and Virginia Allen. Special thanks to our editor-in-chief, Katrina Trinko. We produce Problematic Women in remembrance of our dear friend and former co-host, Bree Payton.